And good day, my listeners. We're at the Book of Lamentations of Jeremiah. You can only imagine what it would possibly be about. Okay, Chapter 1, verse 1. How does the city set solitary that was full of people? How has she become as a widow? She that was great among the nations and princes among the provinces, how has she become tributary? Notes. Now the word how opens the lamentations of Jeremiah. What makes the word so amazing is that it was asked by God himself, not as a question, but more as an exclamation. In other words, how could this have happened to Jerusalem? These who are now on their way to captivity in Babylon are the very people of God. This ruined city is his city. The temple where he once dwelt now lies in a smoking run. How could all of this have happened? Verse 2. She weeps sore in the night, and her tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers she has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. There are become her enemies. Notes. Now who are these lovers and friends who have dealt so treacherously with her and become her enemies? These are the Edomites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and so on and so forth. These are the neighboring nations which, with which Judah formed alliances, including Egypt as well. The Holy Spirit brings it out that she preferred these to God himself. As well, their gods were actually made her gods. But where are they now? The spirit of this text is that trust must never be placed in man, never lean on the arm of flesh. But you need to trust in God. I mean, he is the ultimate source. You can find that in many places, but Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24 is pretty good. Uh, verse 3. Judah is gone into captivity because of affliction and because of great servitude. She dwells among the heathen. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtook her between the straits. Notes. Uh, well, there you have it. Judah's captivity was to be an exile of affliction and great servitude. She served heathen gods. Now she must serve their master. Uh, and he's not a very nice guy. He's Lucifer. She will find him a very hard taskmaster. She now dwells among the heathen. She desired their ways, and now she is given nothing but their ways, and consequently, she finds no rest. Whenever you forsake God and replace Him with something else, it is always going to be of much less value. Verse 4. The ways of Zion do mourn, because none come to the solemn feast. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted, and she is in bitterness. Notes. Now the ways of Zion were the ways of God. However, Judah forsook those ways for the world. But she found only bitterness. What a surprise. Verse 5. Her adversaries are the chief. Her enemies prosper, for the Lord has afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children are gone into captivity before the enemy. Notes. Now, long before Judah was a people or Jerusalem was a city, Moses had said that this would happen if she turned her back on God. And that's exactly what happened. You can read Deuteronomy chapter 28, and it's a very indicative of the United States as of right now. A very great apostasy has certainly happened. We have forsaken God in a very large portion. And we are reaping the fruit thereof. Verse 6. And from the daughter of Zion all her beauty is departed. Her princes are become like hearts that find no pasture. And they are gone without strength before the pursuer. Notes. Now it says all her beauty is departed. And this refers to her glory. This glory was God who is now departed. The pursuer is Lucifer and Judah has no strength to resist him. Uh, it's a very sad state of affairs if you ask me. If you don't have the strength to resist the devil then you've got a problem. 
Verse 7. Jerusalem remembered in the days of her affliction and of her miseries all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old when her people fell into the hand of the enemy and none did help her. The adversaries saw her and did mock at her Sabbaths. Notes. Now the days of old refer to the times when God was paramount and Judah and Jerusalem enjoyed his blessings. These are the pleasant things. Now they are gone. She suffers nothing but affliction and misery. Um, she can only remember. Verse 8. She can only remember misery. Verse 8. Jerusalem has grievously sinned, therefore she is removed. All who honored her despise her because they have seen her nakedness. Yes, she sighs and turns backward. Notes. Now, sin was the procuring cause of the city's ruin she had grievously sinned. As a result of her refusing to repent, she is removed. Those who once honored her now despise her. You know, the nations that would not dare attack Israel at this certain time, uh, they marched right in and did whatever they wanted. Well, Satan does that. He uses a person up, and then he throws them aside. Verse 9. Her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembers not her last end. Therefore she came down wonderfully. She had no comforter. O oh Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has magnified himself. Notes. Well, her filthiness is in her skirts, and this means that for a period of time her defilement was hidden underneath her skirts. Jeremiah chapter 13 verse 22 Boy, we got a knucklehead out there spinning around in the parking lot yeah, We'll just go ahead and let him pass Anyways uh, The expression, O oh Lord, behold my affliction Is the Messiah impersonating Jerusalem You see, right now uh, now their affliction becomes his affliction. Such love one cannot understand. Such is his intercessory role, not only then, but right now. Okay. Where are we at now? Verse 10. The adversary has spread out his hand upon all her pleasant things, for she has seen that the heathen entered into her sanctuary, whom you did command that they should not enter into your congregation. Notes. Now the heathen entered into the sanctuary, and this refers to the soldiers of Nebuchadnezzar entering into the temple, and even into the Holy of Holies, and all because Judah had long since lost the meaning of these things. You know, uh, Moses warned about these things. You can find it in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3, and you can even find it later in Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 9. Verse 11. All the people sigh. They seek bread. They have given their pleasant things for meat to relieve the soul. See, O Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. Notes. Well, they seek bread, and it refers to natural ford, uh, food, of course, which was in short supply. They had come to this place, the place of starvation, because they forsook the spiritual bread. In effect, the word of God. Not only were they starving in the physical sense, but they were they were bone dry in the spiritual sense as well. They had no meat on their bones whatsoever. Verse 12. Is it nothing to you all who pass by? Behold, and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord has afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. Notes. Now, God right here desires that the reader knows and understands that it is not Nebuchadnezzar who actually brought this on, but the Lord himself. His anger was fierce because Judah's sin was grievous. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was a pagan king, and he did what pagan kings often did back that time. Uh, back in that time, they conquered lands, and they tried to establish themselves that way. It was uh, nothing new under the sun. 
and I'm not trying to whitewash history, but I'm just saying that's just the way things went. He may not have had any clue as to what was really actually going on and who was pulling the strings. Verse 13. From above has he sent fire unto my bones, and it prevails against them. He has spread a net for my feet. He has turned me back. He has made me desolate and faint all the day. Notes. Now, when the Messiah's soul was made an offering for sin upon the altar of Calvary, then verses 12 through 15 were fulfilled. For although these words have an application to Jerusalem, their interpretation actually belongs to him. Okay? You can find this also in Isaiah 53, 10, verse 14. The yoke of my transgressions is bound by his hand. They are wreathed and come up upon my neck. He has made my strength to fall. The Lord has delivered me into their hands, from whom I am not able to rise up. Notes. Oh boy, what a long night for me. Uh, anyways... As I stated, Jerusalem is addressed, but Christ is actually intended, just like the previous verse. As God compelled Judah to bear the punishment of her sins, like wearing a yoke or wreath around her neck, likewise he compelled Christ to do the same in order to deliver man. In Christ, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Now, the Lord did such to Jerusalem because they would not heed his clarion call to repent. And he did it to Christ in order that man may be delivered from the terrible crushing blows of sin, of course. The load was so heavy that they were not able to rise up. However, the Lord, in effect, Adoniah, raised Christ from the dead and he will yet restore Judah and Jerusalem. You can see that beginning to happen right now. Uh, the nation of Israel was reborn on May 15th of 1948, and it shall continue on, even though it will look like the Antichrist is going to destroy her very soon. As a matter of fact, it will take an intervention from God Almighty to prevent it from happening. I'll cover that in the book of Ezekiel, which I will be doing very soon because this is a small book. Verse 15, The Lord has trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. He has called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord has trodden the virgin, the daughter of Judah, as in a wine press. Notes. Now this verse right here proclaims the fact that Judah <coughs> trusted in her mighty men and her young men <coughs> rather than God. <coughs> as a result, the Lord has trodden underfoot all those on whom Judah depended. Now, I mean, you know how you trod grapes the ancient way? You took those big chunks of wood and tied them around your feet and you got into the whiskey barrel and you stomped away at them. Not a very pretty picture. <laughs> Verse 16. For these things I weep. My eye, my eye runs down with water because the comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. Notes. Now, if Judah or Jerusalem, for that matter, had wept as Jeremiah was crying right now, the enemies would never have prevailed against her. If Judah and Jerusalem would have simply have repented, they would not have been in this predicament. The temple would probably still be there. Probably uh, God might actually have stayed in there. Uh, but all that because of sin. Verse 17. Zion spreads forth her hands, and there is none to comfort her. The Lord has commanded concerning Jacob that his adversaries should be round about him. Jerusalem is as a menstruous woman among them. <clears throat> Notes. Now, Judah spurned the call for so long until the Lord has commanded concerning Jacob that judgment must come, and it certainly did. Now, whenever it says, as a menstruous woman, Jerusalem must go through her period of uncleanliness and thereby become uh, purified before she will be acceptable. This will happen at the second coming. And the prophet Zechariah said so in Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. Verse 18. 
The Lord is righteous, for I have rebelled against his commandment. Hear, I pray you, all people, and behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men are gone into captivity. Note. Now, the funny thing about true repentance is that it vindicates God and condemns self. Long story short, whenever you are truly going to repent, you just kind of throw up your hands and say, Hey, I blew it. I mean, just uh, like Zacchaeus in the book of Matthew. I mean, not only did he want to, not only did he want to uh, have his sins forgiven, he wanted to go out and prove to the world that he had actually changed from his crookedness. You know, that's a mark of true repentance. Is not only do you want to not do that sin, you want to undo the sin that you've committed. Verse 19. I called for my lovers, but they deceived me. My priest and my elders gave up the ghost in the city while they sought their meat to, uh, to relieve their souls. Notes. Now these lovers were the so-called uh, so-called lovers, actually. They were the surrounding nations who had proclaimed their devotion to Judah, but in fact were being deceptive. Judgment was poured out upon the priests and elders as well. In fact, they were actually singled out because they had led the parade of rebellion against God and against His Word. I mean, can you imagine a modern preacher actually shaking his fist in God's face? That's essentially what they'd done. That's essentially what the Pharisees did in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even later on. Whenever they were hurting Christ, they were hurting the one that was going to turn around and really hurt them later. Verse 20. Behold, O Lord, for I am in distress. My bowels are troubled. My heart is turned within me, for I have grievously rebelled. Abroad the sword bereaves, at home there is as death. Notes. Now, God here proclaims to us the fact of Judah's distress, her trouble, and her broken heart. All of this is because they have grievously sinned and rebelled against God. Well, what a shock there. Verse 21. They have heard that I sigh. There is none to comfort me. All my enemies, has, they have heard of my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. You will bring the day that you have called, and they shall be like unto me. Notes. Now, they are glad that you have done it refers to the gloating of Judah's enemies over her destruction. God shows his people that their safety, security, and protection never were in these nations or alliances with them, but solely in God himself. I think it's a lesson that the modern church as a whole desperately needs to learn. Verse 22, Let all of their wickedness come before you, and do unto them as you have done unto me for all my transgressions. For my sighs are many, and my heart is faint. Notes. Now the term of this proclamation are found here in Jeremiah chapters 50 through 51, and they declare that the Medes will inflict the same cruelty upon Babylon which Babylon inflicted upon Jerusalem. Now, from this fact may be learned the lesson not to rejoice when calamity falls upon an enemy. The evil which uh, brought judgment upon him also dwells in us, and as such, none has any right to boast, but really, we should rather feel sorry for them. Chapter 2. <clears throat> How the Lord covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger and cast down from heaven unto earth the beauty of Israel and remembered not his footstool in the day of his anger. Notes. Now you don't have to be Einstein to see the deep sorrow of this chapter and it's occasioned by the uh, recognition of the fact that the wrath which overthrew the temple was actually divine wrath. You could almost say that God allowed his own house to be destroyed. Never had there been, therefore, such sorrow at this point. But this foreshadowed the wrath which smote the true temple at Calvary. 
That was, that was true sorrow right there, for that temple was without blemish and undefiled, while the temple at Jerusalem which God had planned and set up had been polluted by man and affected by the weather, and, you know, it's it was a building, and it suffered cracks and chip tiling and, you know, wear and tear. Verse 2. The Lord has swallowed up all the habitations of Jacob and has not pitied. He has thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought them down to the ground. He has polluted the kingdom and the princes thereof. Note. Now these verses plainly proclaim the fact that God was the sole source of Judah's blessings and as he is the sole source of the blessings of the church. If he is repeatedly insulted by sin with a refusal to repent, he will throw down the church in his wrath exactly as he did Jerusalem of, uh, of ancient time. I mean, Paul laid it, laid it down very clearly. Paul laid the smack down, if you will, on Romans chapter 11, verse 18 through 22. Uh, very plainly, God says, hey, I'm not going to put up with it. Verse 3. He has cut off in his fierce anger all the horn of Israel. He has drawn back his right hand from before the enemy, and he burned against Jacob like a flaming fire which devours round about. Notes. Now the horn of Israel refers to the kings of Israel. Uh, you know, the horn is actually a symbol of power. Well, we got the king right there. He had cut them off in his fierce anger because of sin. He has drawn back his right hand from before the enemy, and this refers to the Lord lifting his hand of protection over Israel, permitting the enemy to destroy his people. Well, repentance would have stopped this, but despite prophet after prophet being sent by God, uh, with Jeremiah being one of the last ones, the last one, I think, uh, anyways, Jacob simply would not repent. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Once again, I, if memory serves me correctly, I think Jeremiah was the last major prophet. Verse 4. Well, in this particular manner. Verse 4. He has bent his bow like an enemy. He stood with his right hand as an adversary and slew all who were pleasant to the eye in the tabernacle of the daughter of Zion. He poured out his fury like fire. Notes. Now, even though King Nebuchadnezzar <clears throat> was the instrument, the Lord was actually the author. He actually became Israel's adversary. The children of God fighting against the Lord himself. How the devil must have really enjoyed that. Verse 5. The Lord was as an enemy. He has swallowed up Israel. He has swallowed up all her palaces. He has destroyed her, his strongholds and has increased in the daughter of Judah mourning and lamentation. Note. Right there it says it very plainly. The Lord was as an enemy. And it does not actually say that he was an enemy but he behaved as if he was one. In other words, he who was accustomed to blessing Israel now does them harm as an enemy would actually do again because they would not repent. In other words, God is doing something that he really doesn't want to do. Verse 6, And he has violently taken away his tabernacle as if it were of a garden. He has destroyed his place of assembly. The Lord has caused the solemn feasts and Sabbaths to be forgotten in Zion and has despised in the indignation of his anger the king and the priest. Notes. Now this verse proclaims the apparatus of the entire worship of God being taken away. It is. Uh, it included the tabernacle which pertained to all the holy vessels which symbolized the coming Redeemer. I mean, that entire building had some kind of representation of Christ and futuristic things. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. I mean, God just 
uh, the entire building is somehow representing Christ in some way, some shape, some form. God gives one verse to describe the uh, creation of the entire universe. He gives chapter after chapter describing the temple and the tabernacle. You think something important might be there. But anyways, in fact, he took everything away because Israel had so grossly polluted and neglected it. As a matter of fact, it got so bad that... Uh, Oh, gee. It got so bad that parts of the tabernacle actually began to be scattered about. You know, the Ark of the Covenant. If my memory serves me correctly, there was a verse way back there that was uh, describing how the, um, the altar was actually just left out in the middle of a field. Uh, that was really bad. <laughs> verse 7. I can't really quite, it's right on the tip of my tongue. I can't think of the verse, but anyways, verse 7. <coughs> the Lord has cast off his altar. He has aboard his sanctuary. He has given up into the hand of the enemy the walls of her palaces. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as in the day of a solemn feast. Notes. Now, the Lord has cast off his altar is really actually an awful thing. This was the brazen altar, which was a type of Calvary. They didn't want the cross that they had back then, so the Lord took the cross away from them. Verse 8. The Lord has purposed to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He has stretched out a line. He has not withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore he made the rampart and the wall to lament. They languished together. Notes. When it says he has stretched out a line, it expresses unsparing demolition. If you can just imagine a gigantic bulldozer coming into your town and tearing it to pieces, that's what it's actually referring to in 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 13. Not a, not a bulldozer, but I mean figuratively. Just complete do-over. Verse 9. Her gates are sunk into the ground. He has destroyed and broken her bars. Her king and her princes are among the Gentiles. The law is no more. Her prophets also find no vision from the Lord. Note, now this is really bad news. The law is no more is very devastating. You see, a material temple was indispensable to its continued existence and enforcement. However, the temple was destroyed and the sacrifices were stopped. The only light was now extinguished. Whenever it talks about the law, it means that they basically threw the Ten Commandments out the door. And the prophets had no visions from God. And it, a lot of it was because there was really nothing to predict anymore. God had sent one prophet right after another to them, telling them that they need to repent because this disaster is fixing to happen. And, um... Uh, you know, they just, they were stoned, they were beaten, they were tortured, they got sawn in half, they got thrown down into a sewer, thrown into jail. They got the worst kind of maltreatments that you could imagine. So I guess you could say as kind of an act of mercy, God just said, you know what, I'm not going to send another person to go through that kind of garbage. I'm just going to destroy it. Verse 10. The elders of the daughter of Zion sit upon the ground and keep silence. They have cast up dust upon their heads. They have girded themselves with sackcloth. Their virgins of Jerusalem hang down their heads to the ground. Notes. <clears throat> if the action of this verse had been done when the Lord commanded them to repent, the horrible things of this time would never have happened. Verse 11. My eyes do fail with tears, my bowels are troubled, my liver is poured upon the earth for the destruction of the daughter of my people, because the children and the suckling swoon in the streets of the city. Notes. Now this right here speaks of a very bad food shortage with the children staggering because of physical weakness, not because of drunkenness or knocking a few back. You see, Israel was brought to this state with some of them even becoming cannibals and eating their own sons and daughters because of their sinfulness against Jehovah. 
This was actually predicted by Moses in Leviticus chapter 26 verse 29 and Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 53. Unfortunately, that prophecy did come true. With that being said, we'll pick up in chapter 2, verse 12 of the book of Lamentations. Thank you and God bless. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.